it's a field, it's a cultural field, the one of architecture and design, that is not fixed in time. So it's not a subject matter that you always teach. It's not, I'm not always teaching the past. We're actually working on the present and the present is always moving. Hi everyone, I'm Jamie. I'm Amy, and this is Clever. And today we're talking to architect Elena Manfredini. Originally from Italy, she's now based in Los Angeles. Her architecture firm, Atelier Manfredini, is responsible for colorful facades, graphic patterns, and bold statements. She's also currently the chair of Southern California Institute of Architecture's graduate program. She has a passion for education, the philosophy of creativity, and the ideas of genius and truth. It's just me this time. Amy couldn't be there, but we had an awesome conversation. Let's get to it. My name is Elena Manferdini. My design office is in Venice, California, and I have uh, an architectural practice that works between art and architecture, and also I am an educator. I teach because I think teaching allows me to share something I am passionate about with young, talented, like-minded people, and that's probably the best job one could ask for. And I am an architect because I think this profession allows me to think about ideas that are not already existing. So there is this speculative component of architecture that I think it's what drives uh, my desire to be involved in this field. So I want to bring it back to the beginning. I would love to know more about your childhood. Um, were you, did you grow up in Italy? Can you talk about your childhood and your family and what it was like to be a small Elena? I don't know if there was a small Elena. <laughs> There's always Elena. <laughs> <laughs> I have a theory that we don't grow up into adults. We just cope with reality with more and more intellectual and skillful means. Um, mm. But we tend to be our own people, very young uh, and very old in the same possible way. I am Italian, as you can hear from my accent. So I was born and raised in Italy, um, specifically in Bologna, which is a city between Milan and Florence. And I lived there for 22 years. My mother and my father owned a family business um, that has been in the family for a couple of generations. Um, they designed and built mechanical equipment and large machinery to extract building materials from quarries, which I think is a incredibly different experience of childhood just uh, on its own because of what my parents did and mm. where therefore I grew up because they had a factory in Bologna and we lived very close to the factory and the factory was um, also a place where everybody in my family worked. Uh, so my parents were always close by, um, my family was always close by and my cousins. So I remember that the experience of working and the experience of family were in my childhood. I also have great memories of my parents working together, which I think um, it's very rare, Um, Mm -hmm. and having access to their presence and to their intellectual capital anytime I wanted to um, go down the stairs and see what they were doing. I also think that work and my work ethic came from them in many ways, uh, from their Mm -hmm. childhood, because work for them was really paramount, was all they did, and family was within work. And I think with that came uh, a strong work ethic, an idea of a career that supports not only your family, but also employees. And I think there was really nothing uh, light or careless about my family. In in many ways, they worked all the time and we were part of that big picture. I take uh, the idea of drawing uh, from my father. He um, had a technical background and he loved to draw. Um, mechanical drawings and I've seen him drawing since I was a child and the idea of just drawing line with ink on Myler I think is for me connected to seeing him designing, inventing and building things. I think that that relationship was uh, whether or not I like to say that but quite, quite forming in my decision afterwards to become an architect. So You started drawing at a young age. Were there any other things you were doing? Were you working with your hands or did you spend a lot of time outside in in nature? I realized very early on as a child that I was academically strong more than socially Mm. inclined. 
and that uh, being academically strong gave me a certain comfort zone and ability to distance myself from social activities. So I think it was very clear to me that school was a playground for both intellectual abilities mm. and social skills. And I definitely tended to uh, study as my first focus. I think drawing was maybe my only hidden pleasure. Uh, let's say that's something that I was, I was not asked to do in school and mm. also was always denied, but I drew almost relentlessly uh, in school uh, and even before school on any surface that I was um, given to draw <laughs> on or allowed to draw on. Many times I actually was apprehended for drawing on my desk where I couldn't do that. Oh. <laughs> So when you started getting a little bit older, became a teenager, got in, into high school, were you also still very focused on academics and studying? Or were, did you have any rebellious times, any teen angst? Italy is a society where social classes still exist. When I say mm. this, people don't, don't really understand what I mean. But it means that if you're a lawyer, um, your son or daughter would be a lawyer and that you will have a career that the economic and social status of your parents allowed, uh, both in terms of access to education, but even when education is free, which is true for Italy, it's more of a possibility of work. So the biggest rebellion, I think, is knowing that you have a way out of that only through your means and that it cannot be just that. And realizing that my intellectual strength was a valid way out of the life was, was measure on my parents' financial status was mainly what I was focused on in, the, in high school. I have to say I needed to leverage and cultivate those aspects to find a place where I could have the kind of career that I wanted to. This is something that comes across quite quickly, I think, when you go to high school in, in Italy, especially for the high school I went to. I went to um, a liberal art art school. Mm. where we study Latin, ancient Greek, uh, philosophy, um, art history, Italian, and math. And maybe we study English for only two years. So it's, it's a kind of education that usually prepares you for a political life, a life you know, of politics. or Oh, did, did you think in, that was something law. you were interested in doing? or I think... It was the best high school in the city, and mm. that was the thought, you know, at 14, it's not, it, that was a career path. It was more my parents trying to figure out um, what school I, they should send me to, and they sent okay. me to, to, to a good school, more or less, which was a public school, but somehow it's a public school where everybody that wants to get into politics or law goes to. Mm. Um, it became quite evident soon that uh, in order to craft your own path in that society uh, and being free to choose, educate yourself and somehow succeed or fail in the professional field, one needed to work hard to get out of it. <laughs> so, and this is kind of the reason which in, in, in many ways brought me to the understanding that I needed to, to go somewhere else that was not Italy to, to have that kind of more creative career. Oh, interesting. So was that at the point of, of graduating high school? No, that was actually later. We I went to engineering school first. Oh, Italy. that's right. Yes. 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 And, then I, and then I went to the United States afterwards. So going to engineering school in Italy, what prompted you to study engineering? It was a com of my education, as I told you, I went to a high school that was a liberal art in the, not in the American sense, it's truly in the European sense. Uh, and, and I think for however amazing that experience was and how much cultural experience that was, um, it also did not allow me to get in touch with technology or math or geometry or other subject matters that were not part of the curriculum. And I thought at that point that I needed to have also the scientific aspect of life. Somehow that kind of big chunk of knowledge for me to complete my education. So it was more of a desire to make a round decision about uh, what I knew rather than saying I am going to be an engineer. I mean, clearly my father had a company that had a lot of engineering in it and uh, my sister also is an engineer my husband is an engineer so there is quite a bit of of engineers in my family I think it's something that 
always attracts me the way in which, uh, as a society, we create um, a theory of how things work, which is science. Um, mm. And I think that was actually the academic component of this, the pyramid of knowledge, learning what for centuries humankind has been piling up in terms of knowledge to arrive to where we are today was truly attractive to me. Probably much more than the profession of being an engineer, to be honest with you. I was not even clear about what that would have been. You choose certain things at a young age, not knowing if that is really what fits your nature. Academically, it did. Professionally, probably not. That's interesting. So then you decided to pursue something a little more creative. Is that when you went to the U.S.? Yes. U.S. was because it was an exchange program between Italy and the University of California. And at that point, um, I was in my first year of engineering and my partner and I thought about the idea of going abroad and uh, to do one year of education uh, in the United States. Actually, it was his choice to go to the United States much more than mine. And we both applied and we were accepted from UCLA with a scholarship to study that one year. So it was uh, probably never meant to be the moment of change that in reality this became. It was at the beginning supposed to be just nine months uh, in Los Angeles to learn English, to do, um, to go to school, uh, um, to be exposed to a different educational system. And it became a change in career, in change in geographical location. And also a place where I've been living for 22 years. So yeah. <laughs> I, I never knew when I left that it would have been such a divider in my life. Really, I'm now 44. So I think I spent 22 years in Italy and 22 in Los Angeles. Um, oh, so wow. That was a moment where my life <laughs> um, bifurcated. And, and probably I, I could have not predicted that. I was just looking at nine months. So what changed when you got to Los Angeles and you spent some time there? What happened in your life that you decided to make that decision? I think the decision came slowly, uh, meaning I never thought I would stay forever until I realized that I was there for a long time. But it hit me very fast, the idea that American education was offering something completely different from what I had before. The ratio, I mean, something as stupid as the ratio, uh, faculty, uh, students, was something I never experienced. You have to understand that when you go to school in Italy, maybe you have a class of 200 people, 300 people in front of a teacher. And so these are lecture halls where you listen to somebody speaking, but there is almost never an opportunity for a direct exchange or to really work next to somebody that you consider to be a master in your field. Whereas in Los Angeles, I was um, taking some classes at, in architecture because I needed some classes there to complete my education in Italy. And suddenly I was working with phenomenal instructors that I realized uh, I saw their work on magazines when I was in Italy. And suddenly these people were teaching me a portfolio class, a studio, uh, a software. I never had that before. I never realized um, that these people taught <laughs> and they had quite strong footprint into education and that American schools allowed for that contact. So I think that mm. was the first thing, uh, the incredible creative opportunity and exposure to these personalities. I also think I liked the meritocracy of the United States, meaning that um, for somebody like me coming from somewhere else, they had not aged, you know, I had no footprint in the United States. I knew nobody. Mm -hmm. I came with a luggage. And still it felt like uh, what would happen to me was simply depending on my ability to, you know, to work, uh, my intellectual mm. capacity and my willingness to put effort in what I wanted to do. And this is something that people here take for granted when you come from countries where um, it doesn't matter how much you work at something, you can not expect to get it. I think that kind of shift was a substantial one. And even it was in young age at 22, I realized that even in the academic system that meritocracy happened and, and it was quite powerful for me. I mean, you could actually teach, you could take up the, um, teach an assistant position, you could work in stores so that you can, um, you know, sustain yourself. There was actually a whole economy, um, that if you were willing to work hard at it, would help you pay tuition, would help you with scholarship, would help you sustain yourself at a fairly young age. 
And that was, I thought, empowering for somebody like me who wanted to be an author no, in, in my life. I thought this is actually a great opportunity. And I think those so things were not easy to come by uh, in, in Italy, actually. Italy, I mean, there's this idea of postcards of what it is, and it's a phenomenal you know, it's, it's, it's an incredible place. I'm, I'm blessed by the fact that I grew up um, in a place where culture, music, arts is, is everywhere in, in everybody's domain and is always under your eyes. It's something that I, I think as a childhood, having that is a phenomenal upbringing because that gives you certain things that usually you don't get anywhere else, certain culture mm-hmm. you don't get anywhere else. But also, on the other end, it's a society where a lot has been done already, that uh, the economic power is not as strong as it is in the United States. There is less of a, of a place for um, a creative person to make new things, I think. Uh, it's more of a place of history, of remembrance, um, of scholarship, uh, of culture, also of food and all the things that we're famous for. But when it comes to creating newness or technology or making things, I, I think the United States was a much more prolific place to be. And especially Los Angeles was at that point, at the end of the 90s also, was a place of revo- revolution, I would say, in terms of digital revolution in the field of architecture and art. Um, that was the first time where truly computers invaded schools of architecture, mm-hmm. schools of art, um, it was an exciting moment to go from an analog education to a completely digital one. And I was um, just luckily in between those, I was at the cusp of that change. And that change was was interesting to me. So being exposed to a completely digital education was also interesting to me because I was coming from the most traditional one where you would uh, draw uh, monuments and draw them by hand and do this phenomenal, mm-hmm. beautiful pieces. Um, but on the other hand, I also wanted to see the possibilities of uh, working with different media and American University, let's say, at that point where I think probably Compelling um, that change that I think now is a new normal and everybody has those tools. Everybody understands that was has been much beyond academic realms. But at that point in history, I think academia was still a place of research in that way. And that was um, an interesting recipe, I thought. Um, the openness um, of the United States, um, the technology advancements that just by luck were going on at that point. And um, the architectural program at UCLA that was very progressive uh, back Mm. then. So just walk me through the path quickly. So you ended up getting a degree at UCLA. Did you start teaching right away? Or did you start the Atelier Manfredini right away? Or did you work as an architect for another firm? I got, first of all, my degree in engineering. So I... I went home during the summer and I got my degree in engineering. So I'm a structural engineer also, my master. And then I got my uh, master's degree at UCLA after a while. After that, I worked for three years for another architect. And after that, I started teaching and I opened my office at the same time. And I was teaching, I think, my first class when I was 29. Oh, interesting. So what drew you to education? Was it just because you had always been interested in academics as a young child? I I think it's a mix of decision making. Some of them are pragmatic um, and some of them are um, more an ideal setting of research. I think what you have to understand is that education, especially architectural education, is great platform for research as well. So not only you are teaching someone else, but you're truly learning with a group of talented people, um, certain things all together. So, and they might be your colleagues, but also they're your students sometimes. And my students also were almost my age when I started. And so there is this idea that through academia, you can build a body of knowledge. And I think that has been always attractive to me as a way to um, speculate uh, what architecture can do at its highest potential. I also think um, universities offer a technical platform of tools that you rarely have at the beginning of your career in an office. Just having access to certain tools was important to me. And, and I'm, I'm not talking about computers, but rapid prototyping, uh, machinery, robotics, all those things that are actually 
part of the new set of uh, tools and palettes for uh, an architect. At that point, actually, they were quite expensive and rare, and universities had the funds to purchase them. And as an instructor, as well as a student, you have the chance to work with them. And so that also was, I think, part of the attraction. Also, you know, it's uh, part of your personal growth, I think, to understand uh, the transition between being a student and, and to be an instructor. So I don't think it's a very uh, difficult step to think that mm-hmm. what you've learned, you want to then implement it and, and pass it on to other people. There is a sense of, of legacy and enjoyment in that sharing of knowledge. So do you feel like you get something back from your students that you bring to your own architecture practice as you're teaching them? Are you also kind of learning anything from them? I think anybody that teaches uh, would tell you that the act of teaching is intrinsically an act of learning at the same Mm. time. And I do think also that is true for the students. They're not only learning from the teacher, they're actually learning from each other, from your peer. In terms of ideas, creativities, uh, tools, there is you know, an incredible freshness in working with young, uh, like-minded, talented people. And um, they push you and you push them. And it's a field, it's a cultural field, the one of architecture and design, that is not fixed in time. So it's not a subject matter that you always teach. It's not, I'm not always teaching the past. We're actually working on the present, and the present is always moving. And that is the reason that I think it's a fundamental um, difference between certain subject matter where you teach scholarly approaches to the past, and that might be fixed in time, your approach to it. But for an architect and a designer, when you design and work with students, you learn from them while you teach them what you know. Hmm. I want to go back to something you said in the very beginning of the podcast where you talked about the child and the adult being the same. Can you talk a little bit more about that? That sounded really interesting to me. I had a child two years ago, and maybe what I'm saying also um, comes from that. And I realized when I saw him for the first time that uh, his soul is completely formed. I mean, he yes, is going through all the experiences and learning process that a child would go through. But there is something that is an essence of what a human being is that I, I'm not sure I can um, really put a point, a, a finger onto, that it belongs to us since uh, the beginning of time. And I think when I was a child, I remember clearly uh, who I was. And I still think the essence of that person is in me. You just craft and your responses um, according to your experience. But I don't think one becomes really an adult. I think you're, we, we are already adults somehow when you're born and you just learn how to react to reality and how to interact with it. I don't think the older you get, the better you get, or younger you are, the, the, the more experienced you are. I think it's, it's actually a set of coping mechanisms and that get you through life. But there is an essence that I think um, is the same at every age you have. Yeah, that's really interesting. Probably because I'm in my 40s, there's a lot of like these existential questions that have been coming up. Um, And I feel like I, when you said that, I was thinking, oh, yeah, I can kind of relate to that right now in my life. So thank you for for expanding um, on that topic. (laughs) I want to ask you too. another thing that was really interesting to me is when we talked to you um, in episode 85, which is the Be Original USA sponsored episode where we had a panel of experts in LA. During that conversation, you talked about the idea of genius and the role of creativity in society. And I thought that was a really interesting perspective. Could you kind of reiterate that here and just expand on that idea a little bit more? Yeah, I, I think nowadays the concept of genius is pluralized uh, or we can say democratized so much that the genius is ordinary. Everybody's a genius, crowds uh, are a genius, um, everybody's a genius, you have a little bit of a genius in yourself. But that is now, and in reality, there is still some misconception, I think, of what genius is and why it came to be. I even teach a class um, that starts explaining how we got to this point in history. 
I think when somebody thinks about the word genius, uh, it's generally understood as this paradigm of originality, intuition, talent, and brilliance. Now, everybody wants to be a genius because there's something about it that um, really emerges as a cultural hero. But the cultural hero is something that uh, was pushed for in the 18th century. And the idea that also the genius creates something that um, is personal and new. I went to this um, liberal arts school, so which means that sometimes I rely a bit on the um, on Latin and Greek knowledge. If you think about <laughs> Homero, Homero was blind, meaning that one of the most important, two of the most important books of literature from Western civilization supposedly have been written by somebody who cannot see. I think the fact that he was blind was important because it meant that he was bred into bad news, uh, breath of a god, and basically the idea of inspiration uh, comes from Latin and means inspire. Truly, you're, you're, it's not you that have these special qualities, it's God that gives you this ability to produce something extraordinary. I mean, in Greek culture, it was called the demon, which is a lesser god. In Latin, it was a genius. Then afterwards, when it became more of a religious concept, became a garden, a garden angel, or a patron saint. So the idea was that truly it's not about the human man, the, the person that does what it does, but it's about the fact that they're vessel for divinity to go through them. I, I, I always tell my students, and maybe this is important also for you guys, I'm asking them always, what are royalties in your opinion? No, when, when a designer is paid royalties, which I think uh, many probably of the people that are listening to, to, to us today um, want to get paid by companies and royalties. The, the truth is that the, the king is the owner of any copyright and any ideas because the king is a representative of God, the ultimate creator. Therefore, the king is a middleman that gets the cut. So mm. this even just tells you that any design creation uh, in the history of design is not um, based on the ability of the person writing or singing or playing or sculpting or brushing, but is about the fact that that was a vessel of somebody divine, and the king would get the cut, no, of of the of what of the purchase of the artistic output because he is representative of God on earth. Mm -hmm. So it really truly on the 18th century, the genius and uh, originality came to coexist, no? Um, and so doing and making and thinking something that nobody else has done before um, became what a genius is or create became um, the idea of creating something new. So that's really a, a radical departure. Um, and truly really this radical departure is what we still are into, if you think about it, because we, the concept of genius today is truly a byproduct of the 18th century. So the withdrawal from God, a sense of anxiety of being human, the idea of uh, enhanced sense of agency, so humans are actually authors. And so the modern genius really stands for our old idea of divine genius. So that's that's when you know that, that's when the big shift happened. And I think when people talk about genius, they still consider that. To the mm. point that, um, I don't know if you know this is a, a small fact, but Isaac Newton instance, was buried in the Westminster Abbey, which for me was always, when I saw it, was uh, a question mark. Was why would a scientist be in a place of religion? Because truly, the modern genius stands for the idea of the old divine genius. And so at some point, they were even buried into churches. Or, or even you think about Einstein. It was maybe the last of this idea of genius. And his brain mm. was sold and sliced afterwards, not the reliquia of the saints oh. and the reliquia of the scientists um, that is a genius, somehow became something to honor. And I think we still are in this paradigm, that's, but though it has been um, broken down, I think, only in the past 50 or 60 years, I think that World War II has mined um, this problem of the genius, um, bowing before idols, now is seen as elitist uh, or racist or sexist, and genius became really a taboo problem. And uh, now we think that many heads are better than one, 
uh, we even think that there is genius in all of us. Genius is democratized. And even clouds have an intelligence and uh, almost nothing is original. We also think that as post- in postmodernism in general, that ha- everything that has been said before, nothing is original. And every genius, as we thought in the 18th century, is dead, although some of it remains still in the idea of originality, of the originality and creativity. Brian, you know, I think says it at best when he says, uh, I don't believe in genius, but I believe in seniors. Um, the scene of genius, which basically means that we um, can see a collective manifestation of a general cultural product. And so it's not a single um, person that produces a creative act that is unique or new or an, import, an incredible contribution is actually the contemporary society that creates that scene that allows for that to happen. Oh, that's interesting. Do you think that now that we have the internet, which really con- connects us globally, and we're just inundated with information and new ideas and visuals, do you think that that has contributed at all to this collective genius? I th- I think it's manifesting the fact that authorship and expertise is not a fixed concept, meaning Mm. that, for instance, when you open Wikipedia, we all look for things in Wikipedia. I mean, once upon a time, we opened um, the Trakani or the uh, the library or book or an encyclopedia. And the encyclopedia was a place where the experts were called to define what things were. And those were printed at a certain time and those were the author and uh, those were the experts and so truth seemed to be fixed in time and that was a point where i think uh, knowledge was limited truth therefore was very much a concept that was crystallized i think nowadays everybody understands looking at wikipedia if you click on the second page now the second tab not only you see that you see all the people that have been contributing to that concept and they're still contributing. And so you cannot think of truth as being something fixed in time, but it's something that is fluid. Many people participate in and is going to change from today to uh, this afternoon to tomorrow. Uh, the entries of each of Wikipedia definitions are updated anytime and everybody can update them. So mm-hmm. it means that collectively we participate in that construction. I mm. think that is a fundamental difference. I also think the idea of Instagram is a fundamental difference in the fruition of art. Uh, if once upon a time museums were the places where one expert would catalog in an archive what was worth it to be called art, I think nowadays People at their first encounter with art through digital media, either it's mm. a website or Instagram or whatever else. But nobody enters in contact with art uh, just going to the museum. You go to the museum because you've seen something before that told you, I should be interested in seeing this in person. And so the content of Internet also makes something very important that the things that are uploaded are not just the things that are in a museum, the things that actually you take. And uh, it's a two-way stream of information, mm-hmm. and which means that museums, libraries, um, all these cultural institutions that um, were supposed to edit culture um, are now challenged to find a dialogue uh, with social media because social medias are two-way street for not only the expert to say what art is, what a book is worth it, or what um, the definition of truth is, but everybody participates in that, which I think you can see in two ways. One is a positive way. Uh, we've never been so connected. We've never had so many people looking at art as it is today. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have never been so in charge of what our stories. On the other end, how can this institution then um, find their voice of leading uh, their mission? And the mission was culture, art, knowledge for all. Um, is the internet a great medium for that? And the answer is yes, probably. Does that become a trend? And, and, and what are the other activities that all these institutions should do now in order to create a hierarchy of, um, of content for everybody to somehow enjoy? So it's, I think there is a lot to be thinking about. Yeah. I think the genius is only one of the aspects of social media that I think has been for sure 
put into a new lens. I think the concept of Virginia has been questioned for longer than that. I would say that even 60 years is uh, the amount of time I think the concept of Virginia has changed. But today, I think nobody can even sit back and think uh, that there is any truth in most of the media work you have around you. So it's even a question of defining what truth is, not only what uh, creativity is, what um, originality is. It's going to an ethical level. Is that true? (laughs) Not only is it new, is it original, is it actually true? (laughs) (laughs) Which is a much bigger question, I think. Yeah, it is. I want to ask you, I I do, I'm really interested in your own work. Um, You have your own firm, Atelier Manfredini, and your work is really very beautiful. It plays with florals and color and pattern and light. And I just want to, I want to know what's inside of your brain and how you generate your own ideas. You know, you talk a lot about creativity and originality and ideas, but how do your own ideas manifest? I think it's a very difficult question, this one to answer. I, I tend to, I have a theory that there are two different types of artists in the modern era, uh, the conceptualist and the experimentalist. And conceptualists, I think, are the people that make radical innovation very early in age. The experimentalist, I think, have innovation to develop slowly over a long period of, of time. Probably mm-hmm. I am more of the second one, the experimentalist. And I don't think these two types, by the way, are distinguished uh, by their importance. I think historically speaking, you could be a conceptualist and you could be an experimentalist and by the end of your career have um, a great body of work. So it has nothing to do with what place you have in the history of, of creativity. It truly really is how you go about what you create. I think usually the experimentalists like me are based on aesthetically motivated experimentation and conceptualists on the other hand are more uh, based on a conceptual idea and an execution i mean even if you think Cezanne for instance I, I love what he says usually Cezanne says i seek in painting clearly he is an experimentalist so through painting after painting, mm. he modified and researched for, within a long body of work, a certain aesthetic pursuit. Whereas when you, you read Pablo Picasso, he says, I don't seek, I find. Even just to tell you this incredibly different approach um, to the idea that Pablo Picasso would have an idea and then he would execute it. He finds what he has in mind. Whereas pop, people like Paul Cezanne, um, would um, create radical work, but the radical work goes through many levels of iteration. I think I'm more that kind of experimentalist innovator. Uh, there is a trial error. Um, you arrive to major contribution gradually, whereas conceptual innovators usually go through sudden breakthrough and they formulate new ideas, usually very early in age and also very distinct from each other. I know you asked me about uh, my work, so I would say that a lot of the work I do um, also has deep roots into work that is germane to painting. So a lot of the work that people describe as floral usually is actually a critique or a way, let's say, a better way to update mm. uh, the problem of representation of nature, which, you know, it's a landscape. And, and in particular, between the relationship between tableau and tableau vivant and audience and the relationship between the audience and the work. So I work also quite a bit with um, colors um, because I think in architecture, uh, color is quite a bit of potential, probably. Color had a special space in painting and in fine arts in general. Did not hold as much of a position um, in contemporary architecture, at least for a, quite a bit from modernism on. And I find that digital color uh, is today um, very important because I think it's a democratizing force mm-hmm. for architecture. And I think this has a lot to do with our digital media and our um, habits and that fills our eyes and also our free time of feeds, posts and tweets. I think, you know, once upon a time, color was truly linked to how you could make color, which meant Mm -hmm. um, pigments, physical properties or shells, insect berries or chemical materials. Nowadays, color truly belongs to the screen and beams into our eyes 
uh, many hours a day and uh, the range of color that are possible today are almost infinite. And so this, I think, is part of this democratizing force, visual democratizing force of Internet that has tinted most creative fields and architecture is one of them. I think colors is also synonymous of subjectivity, openness to interpretation, and truly, I think, opens up the idea of politics of colors and cultural association to many more uh, audiences and uh, singular view than once upon a time. Um, so I think a lot of the work I do is that it's colorful because the function of color is not to present really this um, vision of an idealized other world, which I think architecture has been doing for a long time. You know, that's uh, the idea of white in architecture. Le Corbusier had also a lot of rippling. Like he, he would have, if he could have, he would have made people paint white at the single uh, home in, in a city in Switzerland. Um, but really, I think the function of color is not to represent this unitized vision, but truly to prompt people to imagine another world for themselves. It's uh, in its full range of possibilities. So I think that's also part of the work I do is to bring um, this pictorial openness and qualities to building facades where actually color did not belong for a long time. Hmm. So when you're bringing all of these colors and patterns and florals or nature into your architecture, are you in a way trying to bring people together? Is that kind of what I'm getting from this and create some sort of universal experience or convey a certain mood or feeling or evoke something in particular? I think that I'm more places where architecture lives that are the place of images and the place of uh, physical artifact. And in the physical artifact, uh, whether or not we like it, we have, we live with architecture so much of our time. It's the background of our, our lives. And I think opening up facades to this, uh, to become uh, creative canvases I think enriches the imagination of the many. I don't think I'm trying to create a single experience. I think most of the work I do um, has shades of colors, has optical effects embedded in them, has different ways in which you can look at them. Um, and so this is actually, mm. there, is a, there is a slow and multifaceted quality of the work that creates a single experience in a public space. And that I think is what happens when you build. I think also there is another life of architects, which is also the images and the renderings and the, and the pictorial quality. They might exist in digital or physical format of drawings. And I think those as well are part of uh, the arsenal of tools of an architect to start creating an audience that would enjoy or like or substantiate building something like that. So I think any building to be built needs uh, multiple steps. One is the one of when you create something imaginative, you want to also, you, you have as a duty the one to um, create an audience for that work so that the work becomes real. So there are multiple steps. I think imagination is the first one. Having an audience that believes in that imagination is very important, whose imagination is trained by your work, and then that creates a desire for the work, and then the work gets built. And so I think the audience, uh, it's, it's a longer process. It's not just I'm creating a spectacle through a facade. It's also I'm creating mm -hmm. the desire for that architecture to exist through teaching, through drawings, through renderings, through installations, through things that start building uh, a desire for something different and that, that seeks into reality. How do you define whether or not architecture is successful? I am not sure, um, as a general term, one could define architecture is successful, successful in relationship to uh, the mm -hmm. client needs, to the audience response, to the longevity of the piece, to the um, level of engagement. There's so many factors. I think it's difficult to say what is 
I mean, I think it's successful for me. I can tell you what is successful in my practice and what I think makes me want to work on something. Uh, and I'm not sure that's successful in general for my client, mm. but, right. <laughs> but definitely that makes me, it ma- ma- makes me, makes me want to do certain things. I think architecture is successful when, um, is able to train collective imagination. I think we're used to see boring architecture. I mean, and by boring, I mean, uh, completely uninteresting. It goes into the background of our lives and it is kind of si- sneaking in as being the only possibility, meaning that we walk uh, in the cities and we don't imagine them to be able to be anything else because we think what is out there must be what is available to us. In reality, I think architecture that is groundbreaking is the one that shows that other things are possible. Mm. And um, that I think is very successful because it's not just the building or just the facade or just the artwork that creates that. It's more that you're training people to think that there is an alternative out there. And that I think is very important in life in general to know that what you have is what you choose, but um, you can also choose and make something else happen. We're really uh, and uh, we are participants in in this reality and. Being able to be agent in that change is uh, a fundamental knowledge for um, people living in a democracy. Or you know, it, you know, it goes beyond. It goes beyond just the idea that something else could physically be there. Mm-hmm. It just something else could also happen through your activity and through your participation. So I think that that way of framing the audience is very important. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, I want to ask you a few personal questions because I you're very passionate in general. You've talked about your passion for architecture and for creativity and for education. Do you have passions outside of your work? I have so many works that I think I have no time. <laughs> no, I teach and uh, I'm the chair of a graduate school and uh, I have a small practice that deals with art and architecture. So this, this keeps me quite busy, but I, um, and I have to say, I truly think that I made of my passion my work, um, which I, I, I think it's um, an important decision that I made early on. And I think I never choose to do it in my life. Also, maybe it's something besides my um, my work. Uh, I became a mother recently, as I as I mentioned, mm-hmm. and probably motherhood has made me break certain work habits. Let's say um, <laughs> I think motherhood is a very common experience. Not most women become mothers in their lifetime, and most people have a relationship with their mother. So I don't think I'm saying anything that anybody else. No, as an experience, I might not be uh, also very experienced as a mother either because I've been a mother only for two years. But um, maybe one one thing that is fun about be- being a mother uh, is that it made me completely see in a different way the art is uh, 300 years of art history, which I never truly completely understood before giving birth. You know, when you look at the art history painting and you see one of the trope of painting is the Madonna and child, no, it's a benchmark for painters, Mm -hmm. similarly to portraits and landscapes. And I truly never understood why this trope of painting, I mean, I understood that there's, you know, some religious propaganda or a philosophical necessity to find a beginning for the humankind. No, so I, I understand that part of the, of the subject matter that, you know, it was fitting a certain requirement at some point, a philosophical need, uh, a religious propaganda. But I realized that it was actually so much more a much more common and touching human kind of experience. And maybe that's why so many painters uh, made of this, the idea of, of being mother, the trope of painting. And it traversed so much of the history of painting because it is a transforming experience for women and for men together. So maybe this is something I understood only becoming a mother. I thought, you see, I became a different uh, art appreciator because because something in my banal, normal family life happened that made me completely change my lenses through which I see mm. what I usually teach, no? It's which is history of art, history of architecture, the tropes of painting and and, and it made me change the way I see um I see some of the past I knew, I thought I knew. What do you think is the key to living a good life? Oh my God. I don't know. I made some choices that I'm not sure that I key to live a good life, but some choices that help me find a sense of purpose. Uh, and maybe that purpose brings 
a sense of stability that what I'm doing is what I should be doing. I mean, I, I know I said I, I'm an educator, but I think it's a little bit more than being an educator. What I do, I think I plant myself in one organization and I work towards one mission, which is the School of Architecture. I think um, this gave me freedom and privilege to make a lasting difference for many people. Being an ed- educator uh, was a surprise, actually, for me, to be honest with you. I, I, I didn't understand that being an educator was uh, creating a legacy, b- beside, you know, the fact that you learn and you teach, but also became an important component of me leading a good life. Mm-hmm. I think practicing only in my office would never be as fulfilling without a real and concrete engagement in society. So, so just to say that to me, teaching is not uh, a job. It is what actually makes life meaningful is, is to understand that you have agency uh, on a larger group of people that enjoy your presence and understand your presence is important. And I think you having the privilege of making a difference in other people's uh, life and creative life, I think it's, uh, it's, it's incredibly rewarding. And I think in any practice, having a social component is not a waste of time. It's actually uh, what makes the project go beyond somebody's capability into much bigger hands, into a much bigger network. I, I think that is never an individual journey. So maybe that's something that came through age. I think this, you know, intellectual and design values are nurtured by strong communities, self-confident community. Being part of one, I think, is very important. I think it's also very important to defeat um, this tendency that there is today of being self-sufficient and uh, accept the fact that we are in mutual dependence of one another. And mm. uh, you have to come to terms with the limitation of reality and this still leads a positive advancement for many. And this has been many, you know, maybe at the beginning when I became the chair of the program at SIRC was definitely an adjustment to understand that you are only as good as the people that work with you or work for you are, and that actually they bring a value you don't have. And that um, that collaboration with all the inefficiency of any collaboration possible and all the frustration that you might have because you have uh, people that are different than you doing things that you would like to be done differently. <laughs> but besides all of this, you really come to terms that self-sufficiency will never allow you to reach uh, to the level of completion in life that you can with other people in a community. And I think our society really pushes for self-sufficiency mm-hmm. um, and individuality and genius and special creation, newness, and you do it all alone. In all reality, being part of uh, a community and managing to lead a positive change for many, maybe not the perfect change that you would have wanted on paper before, but still managing a compromise, uh, but positive change is truly more than what you could do alone. And, you know, collaboration makes a big part of the satisfaction of having and leading a good life. I think the great achievement in life are found in the giving and receiving of care of many. And the more people you can touch and reach with your work and with your enthusiasm, uh, the better life you're going to have in terms of just personal richness. I absolutely agree with all of that. (laughs) Um, You mentioned legacy and I was going to ask you if you thought about that, but I guess you you have. But have you ever thought about it in a different way, um, whether it's architecture or having a child or anything else? In general, my work will hopefully, if I can, if they allow me to, will always try to find a legacy working with institution whose mission I believe in. And you know, they could be schools or museums or um, cultural institution that promote arts, education. Um, I, I truly believe that my contribution to the world is, is, is that, is that philanthropic. I would love to be part of a philanthropic institution in general. I think it's, as a creative being, I enjoyed, and I was the first-hand receiver of very generous um, scholarships when I was in school or opportunities to show my work and to produce my work. It's, it's part of, um, I think, being a creative person to also be given the chance to do the work you do. 
I think I've been lucky enough to have been given those opportunities when I was in school or just out of school or in my first year of teaching. And I think it's important in the natural progression that role changes. And now I'm more on the support of other um, individuals when I work as a chair. Um, what we do is, you know, I, I, I hunt at hands for talents mm -hmm. and for people that can come to school and, and create this incredible community or I connect them with possible work opportunities. I welcome um, donations, certain things that actually make a stronger community much beside my own practice, which I have and I love doing. And, and this is, you know, the legacy of my work will stay in, in the artwork I make. But I think there is also that second legacy, which for me is, can you then enable a creative community to happen? And that also is, I think, part of growing up is to understand, you know, that, that those things move around. And if in a certain time of your life, you, you need to receive them. At a certain time of your life, you actually need to donate them. And, and these are equally joyful moments. So you mentioned being part of a philanthropic organization of some sort. Are there any other personal or professional goals or things you hope to achieve or accomplish in your lifetime? I definitely would like to grow my office more. Um, this is something that I've been working on for a while with, with the people in my office. Um, they're all fantastic individuals. So I think we are the pivoting point uh, to get bigger projects, more grand up projects. So I think architecture and art um, are, is, is still are what I need to do. And we accomplish a certain scale of work and we're moving to larger scale of work, which I think is something that would enable um, the office to have a stronger legacy, uh, more durable footprint on um, in the architectural domain. So I think we, we are really much looking towards that. Do you have any projects that our listeners should note or be on the lookout for? We have been working quite a bit in Chinatown lately um, with a developer that um, has been gracious enough to give us a few canvases to work on. And that has been not only a great relationship, but also a fun experiment. We also are working um, a lot in, uh, in Asia uh, right now on larger projects for a stadium. Um, and so we hope that that will go to fruition and um, I mean, the office is also producing two books that will be published by the end of the year. Those are collections of the work uh, we've been doing in the past five or six years in the practice. It's been also a moment of reflection uh, to focus on what the body of work looks like and, and how to then progress to the next phase of the office. So that has been a fun experience this summer to put together an extensive publication and putting words to the words of, of the images. That's fantastic. And where can our listeners find you on the web and social media? www.ateliemanserdini.com or Instagram, the ubiquitous um, social media, uh, Atelier Manferdini. Great. Well, thank you, Elena. This has been such a great conversation. Thank you. It's been a, it's been a pleasure talking to you today. Thanks for listening, everyone. To see images of Elena's work and read the show notes, click the link in the details of this episode on your podcast app or go to cleverpodcast.com, where you can also sign up for our newsletter. If you haven't already, please subscribe to Clever on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. And if you'd also do us a favor and rate and review, it really, really helps. We love to chat with you guys on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. You can always find us there at Clever Podcast. Clever is created, produced, and hosted by us, Amy Devers and Jamie Derringer, also known as 2VDE Media, with editing by Rich Straffolino and music by L1011. Clever is proudly distributed by Design Milk.